Lord, we come humbly before you again. We pray that the wisdom that we so desire will be given. Again, we ask that you create within us a clean heart, O oh God, and your right spirit within us. Breathe life into this message because it is your word and you have said it will not come back void. We're depending on that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Revelation chapter 7, verse 2. We're going to go back to where we were a few moments ago. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God where? In the forehead. In the forehead. Only God's people are sealed in the forehead because they have chosen to worship Him. Do, do we all understand that ultimately where we end up is our choice? Do you understand that? It's our choice. We choose where we are going to be. And it's not, yeah, it, it, it's usually one big choice, but then there's a bunch of little choices afterwards. Every day there's choices that are being made. Have you ever heard that little voice speak to you and say, yeah, I don't think you ought to go that way, huh? Yeah, that's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. To understand the mark of the beast, we must first understand God's sign, seal, or mark. So what is the mark of God? Let me spend just a little bit of time with it. And I like to use an earthly illustration because I think it really helps us understand that with every kingdom, nation, they always have an official seal. Have you noticed that? Even the Romans, they sealed the tomb of Jesus in honor of the Son of God. Okay? Now, a seal has or contains three parts. The name, the title, and the territory over which this power consists. In Isaiah 8.16, seal the law among my disciples. So where is the law placed upon those who are faithful? Notice this. Seal of God has to do with worshiping God. It has to do with His Word. Notice Hebrews 10.16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their what? And in their minds I will what? You catch that? That's what the Bible does. It doesn't, it's not a literal 777 on the forehead of the good people and 666. Hollywood likes to do all that. Don't get your theology from them. Usually you just believe the opposite of what they say. Have you ever been around a person you know that you just have to believe the opposite of what they say? I've, had, I've run across a few people in life where whatever they tell me, I know that it's just the opposite. Okay? It's the glasses which they see through. And I don't see through those glasses. Not that I'm any better or whatever. So, the law of God is written where, ladies and gentlemen? In the heart. When it's not written in the heart, the person is unconverted. The law points... It's bony finger at you from those two cold tables of stone and says you are condemned. But when the law of the Lord is written into the fleshy parts of our mind, into our heart, we are in a heart relationship with Him. And love makes the difference. So how is this done? 2 Corinthians 1.22 who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a what? Guarantee. Guarantee. So how are we sealed the mark? Through the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 2.19 Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and that everyone who names the name of Christ depart from what? Or lawbreaking. Have the law of God in the heart. The seal of God is connected with departing from iniquity. The seal of God has to do with the law of God. Now we want to search the law to see which part actually does constitute the seal. 
First, let's find out what constitutes God's power and authority. What gives Him the right to ask us to worship Him? Isaiah 45, 18. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited, I am the Lord and there is no other. So what is the Lord's claim to fame, ladies and gentlemen? He's the what? What does He Jess? He's the creator. He's the creator. Creator God. He made us. So what is a sign of the memorial of God's creative power? It's simple. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. That's Genesis 2.1. Genesis 2, 2, and on the seventh day God ended His work which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had done. Verse 3, then, the, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it He rested from all His work which God had created and made. The seventh day, you notice the things that God did. Now keep in mind, this is a day that God created in the fabric of time. This is not a Johnny come lately. This is part of creation. How many of you believe that God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life? Man became a living soul. How many of us believe that God made all the seven days? Of course. Then why do we struggle with the fourth commandment? Which is a day that he made. And he put it in time. Time. It's locked into the <coughs> weekly cycle. When you look at the weekly cycle, ladies and gentlemen, there's no heavenly body that, that controls. You ever notice that? The moon, the month, the year, the sun, but the week, there's nothing. It's because God created it that way. He established it. It's based on a thus saith the Lord. God sanctified that day and God rested that day. <coughs> So God blessed and sanctified it and rested on it. Now we're ready to search God's law to find the seal. Let's look at the Ten Commandments very quickly. Just an abbreviated form. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt, commandment two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Commandment three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Commandment four, honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill, commandment 6. Commandment 7, thou shalt not commit adultery. Commandment 8, thou shalt not steal. Commandment 9, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Commandment 10, thou shalt not cut. Did I miss anything? Four. 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 Did I forget a commandment? Which one did I forget? Number four. Oh, that's going away. <laughs> that's what I've been told. It's not done away with. I want you to notice. It's the whole Word of God written in our heart. It's the relationship with Christ, the sealing, the Holy Spirit. But there's an issue, ladies and gentlemen, that has always been an issue. And we saw the beginning of that abominable issue when Lucifer brought in to the Jewish church the worship of the Son. That and the last abomination are going to be the two big things down here at the end of time. But the devil has developed his deception. You're going to see this. You're going to see that God's people keep all the commandments of God, including the fourth. Because the fourth you're going to see actually has the seal of God in it. Or in other words, it shows us that he's the creator. Watch this. It's got all three components of the seal in it. It's the only commandment that has this. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Now remember, seal has a name, title, territory. God sealed his name. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For in six days, who made? Lord. Yahweh, the Lord, made the heavens and the earth to see and all that is in them and rest of the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, set it apart for holy use. His title is creator. His territory is heaven and earth. That's the only one of the Ten Commandments. They tell us his name, his office, 
and his territory. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the fourth. The devil hates the fourth commandment. That's why he brought sun worship into the church back there. And he's done it again down here at the end of time. And I understand for some of you it's hard to wrap your mind around this. You're saying, how can all these people be wrong? And how can Pastor Harry be wrong? He's sincere, he's a godly man. I'm not to judge Pastor Harry or whoever. But I know what the Bible says. And if my wife comes and says that Friday and she turns Islamic, you think I'm going to turn Islamic? By God's grace, I'm not. My wife can hold on to what she wants to believe because she's a free moral agent. She has freedom to do that. Am I going to disagree with her? Yeah, when she tries to convert me to Islam, I'm going to show her the fallacy of Islam by God's grace. I painted you as a bad no, person. No, <laughs> Fourth commandment is a major point of attack by the devil. You're going to see this. Notice Ezekiel 20 verse 12. What God says about this. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me, speaking of Israel, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. And yet there they were, worshiping the sun. God called it an abomination. And Romans 4, 11, just, just for the fun of it, this is principles, okay? We're not talking about circumcision. We're talking about the use of words. You can use a seal. You can use mark. It's the same thing. In the Bible, a sign or a seal represents the same thing. And he received the sign of circumcision. Now, we're not talking about circumcision. We're just using the interchange of, of terms. Circumcision, a seal of the righteousness. So sign and seal is used interchangeably in here. So the seal and the mark are in competition. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you like Ford trucks? Won't drive anything but a Ford truck. Okay, oh, two people back here. How many? Oh, okay. GM truck, Chevy GM. Only Chevy GM. Raise your hand. Come on, Andy. You've got a GM. That's what you got. Now, is Ford, oh, Dodge. You like Dodge, right? Cummins? That would tell you what I'm talking about, okay? So anyway. They do what? No matter what it is, it's working right. I took care of it. It'll give me service. There you go. Now, my, just think about it. Is Ford and GM in competition with each other? Well, you better believe they are. One wants to sell more vehicles than the other. It's hard for me to believe people are paying $100,000 for a bigger truck, but they are. Not going to happen for me, even if I had the money. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, I want you to notice something here, folks. If anyone worships the beast at his image and receive his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So, those that receive the mark of the beast will receive the seven last plagues, right? The wrath of God. Now I want you to notice, this is by the way the last warning message given to this planet, Revelation 14. It shows two groups of people, those who worship God and those who worship the beast. Now look at this. Look carefully at the text. We've already read about those that receive the mark. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who, what? And the faith of who? It's obvious that those that receive the mark of the beast, they don't keep the commandments of God, do they? No, if they did, they wouldn't be in trouble. And the faith of Jesus. A great safe relationship with Jesus leads to loving obedience. So right here, ladies and gentlemen, if I only had to show you three or four Bible verses. If I only had to show you three or four Bible verses. It's right here. Easy. You look at those that are lost, and you look at those that are saved. You look at the characteristics of those that are saved, and you look at the characteristics of those that are lost. And what the lost don't have, the saved do have. And it tells you the issue right there. 
Keeping the commandments of God. In other words, the law of the Lord, the word of God is written in their minds and in their hearts because of a love relationship with Jesus. Obviously, the other bunch is a bunch of lawbreakers. It's clear. There is no ifs, ands, and buts about it. Two groups. Every one of us in this room will find ourselves in one group or the other ultimately. It's not based on sincerity. It's not based on good works. It's not based on hoping. It's not based on wishing. It's based on a decision to follow the Lord each and every day, no matter what it costs or where it leads. Perfect timing. That music was yeah. just right. <laughs> So what is the mark of the beast? This is what you want to hear. What is the mark of the beast? Daniel 7, 25, one of the identifying marks of the beast power. He would think to change times and laws. Now, notice what the Church of Rome says. In one of their books. Quoting now, the Pope has power to change, and I can't say that anyway, so you can read it for yourself right there. The Pope has power to change times to abrogate laws and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. That's yeah. blasphemy. That is. That is. Like two sacred rivers flowing from paradise, the Bible and divine tradition contains the word of God. Though these two divine streams are of equal sacredness, still of the two, tradition is to us more clear and safe. Catholic beliefs. Now, I want to be. I want to hasten to add, we're not talking about Catholic people. I grew up, all my friends were Catholic. They've been through catechism, they went to Catholic schools, especially my, one of my best friends, Don, he went all the way through Catholic schools. He didn't understand all of this, even though he went through catechism and all of those things. So I'm not saying anything about Catholic people. I'm talking about a system of worship. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen, if I could keep you in another book and keep you away from this, and this is all you knew from a child up, like Islam, you know, the Koran, whatever, you might believe that. But if you were raised with this, with your parents diligently reading Scripture and sharing Scripture with you and studying the Bible, you would have a different outcome. So the Church of Rome has made up their own rules and regulations. But those of us that want to follow the Bible, even if you're a Roman Catholic and you want to follow the Bible, then you've got to step away from tradition. You have to stand, step away from all these books and what all these wise men say. If you're a Protestant here, Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, um, Pentecostal, whatever, we got egg on our face. Because we say we're going to follow the Bible and the Bible alone, but we find ourselves doing all kinds of things the Catholic Church does that are unbiblical. Now, the Catholic Church does do things that are biblical, and I, I don't have a problem with that. But what you're about to see is startling. What does the Roman Catholic Church claim as her sign or its authority? Catholic Record, September 1, 1923. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. The authority of the church could therefore not be bound to the authority of the scriptures, because the church had changed the Sabbath into Sunday, not by a command of Christ, but by its own authority. Sunday is founded not on scripture, but on tradition, and is distinctly a Catholic institution. If you are a Protestant here, a Protestant here, can't hang on to that, ladies and gentlemen, even though your church does. Here's the thing. Never think I'm trying to be condescending. I've had to learn just like you. And granted, I have been given the opportunity to have time to study. Most of you work 8, 10 hours a day, understand you're tired when you get home, you fall asleep reading the Bible. I have been called to be able to do this. So don't think that I'm bow, brow beating you because. 
But let me just say this. Study the history of your church. I know people that are Baptists, Southern Baptists. They have no idea the history of their church. Grandpa and grandma were, grandma and grandpa, or great grandma and grandpa, grandma and grandpa, mom and dad, sisters, brothers. Well, this is all we know. But ask yourself, do I really know the history or am I just trusting? And you should trust your family. But when it comes to biblical things, trust no one. <coughs> You've got to go to the Bible, folks. If you're Presbyterian, have you studied the history of Presbyterian? What about the Lutheran Church? If you're Lutheran, have you studied it? You see, we need to know. If you're a Seventh-day Adventist here, have you studied the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Whatever. Pentecostal. Where did that come from? Where did the holiness churches come from? Where did the slaying in the Spirit come from? Speaking in tongues. Where did that come from? People say, well, it comes from the Bible. Have you studied the history of how it came in? Just simply say, no. Because it's so easy to hear something new and different and say, nope. It's not the way I was raised, not the way I was taught. Always question everything. Question the way you were taught. Remember, I told you the story at the very beginning of these meetings. My parents raised me when I was admitting that there was a Santa Claus. And I believed in Santa Claus. I believed in the Easter Bunny, too. Until I figured out who they were. And then I lobbied them directly for what I wanted, not stupid letters to the North Pole. <laughs> I am challenged all the time when I read the Bible. God's challenging me and showing me things that I need to have right think. And I want to say this and then I'm going to move on. Do not, please, do not put your trust in the arm of flesh. A lot of people today, they're a die-hard Republican or die-hard Independent or die-hard Democrat. You can do whatever you want civilly, but I'll tell you what, you better be a die-hard Christian, a born-again Christian loving Jesus. We need to be very careful about trying to use the secular arm of the state to push the Bible on people have to understand the principle we're free moral agents. Freedom of choice is the most precious gift we can have. Jerry, you can choose to build your house or not build a house. I mean, within the parameters of the rules and regulations of the county, granted. But we have choices that we can make. Don't you have a choice of what breakfast you're going to have, what you're going to have for supper, right? Yeah. What you're going to do tomorrow, whatever. You like freedom of choice, don't you? If you want a long beard, <coughs> look like Robert E. Lee sitting there. No pun intended. Yeah. It reminds me a little bit of my nephew Eli, though, doesn't he? Just a little bit. Yeah. All right. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Catholic Church says, no, by my divine authority, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. An abridgment of Christian doctrines. Question, how can you prove that the church has power to command feasts in the holy days of the Catholic Church? By the very act of changing the Sabbath into Sunday, which Protestants allow of, and therefore they are fondly contradicting themselves by keeping sun Sunday strictly and breaking most other feasts commanded by the same church. Have you any other way of proving that the church has power to institute festivals of precept? Had she not had such power, she could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day of change, for which there is no scriptural 
I thought her too. So how do they get the authority to do that, man? They say they have it. That's it. They call it apostolic authority. They say that God, through Peter, gave them the power that they are the church and the tradition is above the Bible. My, my, my. Now, oh, just hang in there with me. Yeah. Sunday is a Catholic institution and its claim to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. From the scriptures, from the beginning, excuse me, from the beginning to the end of scriptures, there is not a single passage that warrants the transference of weekly public worship from the last day of the week to the first. Now, what's amazing to me is that Protestant preachers try to prove this. There's only eight texts in the whole Bible that mentions the first day of the week, and there's never a command to keep it. Never. The mother of churches. The faith of millions. But since... Saturday, not Sunday, is specified in the Bible. Isn't it curious that non-Catholics who profess to take their religion directly from the Bible and not from the church observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Yes, of course, it is inconsistent, but the change was made about 15 centuries before Protestantism was born. They have continued to observe customs even though it rests upon the authority of the Catholic Church and not upon an explicit text in the Bible. That observance remains the reminder of the Mother Church, from which non-Catholic sects broke away, like a boy running away from his mother, but still carrying in his pocket a picture of his mother or a lock of her hair. Now you say, Steve, how is all of this going to play out? And what are you saying is the mark of the beast? I'm saying the law of God, the word of God, the seventh day Sabbath placed into the mind through a grace saved relationship with Jesus is the seal of God. The mark of the beast of her ecclesiastical power is that she says, I have the authority to change the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. We already looked back at Ezekiel and we saw how the devil brought in sun worship into the church back then. It was, it was one of the most grievous abominations besides offering up their children to idols. We will find that those last two abominations, ladies and gentlemen, will be prominent and paramount down here at the end of time. We already have a place to establish that the devil brought sun worship into the church back then. He has brought sun worship into the church down here. I know it's painful. I know it hurts. My heart goes out to you folks that have kept Sunday for years and years and years. But I appeal to you by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, by His power, to keep the fourth commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to be saved, but because you are saved. And do not listen to the arguments to say, well, it doesn't matter. You can pick one in seven. That is not in the Bible. That's man-made. Well, use a democracy approach. If the majority are doing it, it must be what? I heard something interesting yesterday on the radio. On the radio, they were talking about you know these little buggies you push around? What are they called, Connie? Food carts? Whatever you, you remember you had to pay a quarter to get one? The carts that, that you put, huh? The buggies. There you go. Well, there's a guy that is called the Buggy Narc. How many of you have heard of the, bu the, the Buggy Narc? This guy just shows up in a parking lot, and when people leave their buggy right out in front of their car and start bringing it back to the corral, and I've literally seen buggies go across the parking lot and hit nice cars. I've tried before to keep it from happening. 
And there was this one lady in California where they played the conversation between her and the buggy narc. <laughs> and he's filming her and he said, you know, lady, you're big old lazy bones. She goes, what are you talking about? Well, you didn't put your cart back. And they went on and on, and she said that she did documentaries and that he didn't have the right to film her, and blah, blah, and they went on and all, went back and forth, back, calling each other names, this and that and the other. But the buggy nerd knows the laws. She didn't. But here was her excuse. And this is the majority of the excuses that the buggy nerd hears. Well, everybody else does it. It must be all right. That may be all right for putting your buggy away. But when it comes to the word of God, it's different. I want to give us an opportunity today as we close. And we're going to get into this. We're going to answer this question in the future. In the future, the final issue of law will center around worship. We're going to get into that. We're going to go much deeper into this this week. We've got some heavy stuff this week. But I want to give you an opportunity to make a decision today. I have a little card. The table leaders could pass out this little card. It's called My Decision for Christ. I think in light of everything that we've studied so far, I pray that you would really think about what is on this card. And I hope everybody has one of these cards. Luke 19, 9 and 10. Luke 19, 10 is my favorite Bible verse of all times. But I'm going to read verse 9 also. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. For as much as he also is the son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is Lord. I like to personalize that and say Jesus came to save me. Did he come to save you? And maybe you've made a commitment to Christ, but today you'd like to recommit. The first thought is I believe that salvation comes only by grace through faith in Christ. If you believe that today, that you're saved by grace, not by works, not by doing, but by Christ, Christ alone. Maybe there's some here today that say, I once knew Jesus, but I've drifted away. And today, I want to recommit my life to Christ. You'd like to recommit your life to Him today. Why don't you check that? And then maybe there's somebody here today that has never accepted Jesus as their personal Savior. And they'd, they'd like to make that public. I repent of my sins and accept Jesus as my personal Savior, believing that my sins are forgiven and the gift of eternal life is mine. As soon as Connie and I are done here, we're headed over to our little church, the Lighthouse in Huntersville, and where we're members. I'm not the pastor of the church, but um, I go there a couple times a year because I'm always on the road. But I've got a baptism. Jared's being baptized today. Jared has had a past of drugs and different things. But he truly, truly wants to say to the world, I have recommitted my life to Christ. I want to be baptized. I want Jesus to wash away my sin. So today, he will go down into that watery grave. That's why I can't stay for lunch. You guys understand. But we're going to have a baptism here. And maybe there's some folks here that would like to say, you know, I want to be biblically baptized the way Jesus was. Die to self, buried in the water, and come up unto the newness of life. Or maybe you might say, well, I was raised in the Catholic Church and I was sprinkled as a child. I, I don't even know what really happened, but 
I'd like to be biblically baptized. That's your mindset. And the Spirit of God is really moving upon your heart. Just write a B. Just a B. Capital B somewhere on the card. If you've been baptized before biblically and you're saying in your mind and in your heart, you know, I've slipped away and or I'm like those people in Acts 19, which learn new truth, and because of new truth, we want to be rebaptized. Put an RB on your car. But today is all about accepting Jesus, following him. I understand what I presented, you have somewhat of a knowledge, but through this week, we're going to flesh out this. You'll understand it more clearly. But right now, we know that the seal of God has to do with Christ in the heart. And you're saying today, I pledge allegiance unto Jesus. I'm taking my stand today. I don't care what people say, what people think. I know what God wants me to do. And I remember the night that I made that decision to be baptized. So a series of meetings just like this. Preacher was a big old six foot two red headed preacher. Loved Jesus with all his heart. And I remember when he made that appeal. I came down out of the out of the balcony. See, I was kind of hiding. The Holy Spirit moved me, and I walked down that aisle, and I stood up. I was the first person up there. I almost ran up there because I know what Jesus has done in my heart. And you might say, Well, why do I need to make that public? Well, Jesus himself said, if you're going to deny me in public, I'll deny you. But if you acknowledge me in public, I will acknowledge you. There's something about our human nature that we need to place our allegiance publicly on God's side. So, make that decision today. For Christ, what I'd like for you to do is we're going to take a moment of silence. I'm going to pray quietly. I want you to, to look at the card. Listen to the Spirit of God as He speaks to your heart. We're going to close with a word of prayer. I want you to flip that card over and hand it to the person that's leaving out at the table. And then they're going to place it right here under my Bible. Right here. I'm going to pray quietly to myself while you make a decision. Father, as we bow before you, I sense that there are people in the valley of decision. Some may realize that they've been religious but not spiritual. Good moral people, church-going people, but not having that vibrant relationship with Jesus that your word talks about. And today, they want to make that decision. Spend time in your word. Spend time in a relationship. Growing in grace. Praise you. We thank you. And Lord, I pray that you would give the extra strength and confidence to those that are in the valley of decision. And help us to understand not to make a decision for your side doesn't mean that we haven't made a decision. By not making a decision for you means that by default we fall to the human nature side, which is ruled by the dwellers of darkness. Set us free today. Create within us a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit. Help us to walk in the newness of life. Help us to prepare those that are choosing to be baptized to, to walk in that newness of life. And Lord, help us realize that it's not only 
the decision that we're making for ourselves, but if we have children, we're making decisions for our children also as to what they're going to see in us as parents and grandparents. And Lord, for those that don't have children, they're not married, help them to realize they're friends, they're family members. And Lord, help us also to understand and realize that the devil will try to get us to procrastinate, to hold off, to think that we have to wait or we have to wait on other people. But the Bible example, Lord, has always been the same. Each individual must move with the moving of the Spirit when the Spirit speaks to our hearts. That way, as we choose you, choose your way, we become, by your grace, Father, an example to others to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Help us not to procrastinate or hold off. In Jesus' precious name, we thank you. Give all honor and glory. Amen.